back to another episode of Sean Nets Do Baseball. I'm Sean. And I'm Ed. And we are doing the baseball history. That's right. We're a bi-weekly baseball history podcast where the story catcher doesn't know what the story pitcher is going to be on the mound throwing them. That's right. And I'm excited. Uh, what, do you, what, what, what do you want? What do you want to do? What do you want to throw today? I think it's just going to be a straight fastball today. <laughs> Straight up, yeah. We're just gonna get. We're gonna power through this one. Nothing, uh, nothing too crazy. Just gonna go rely on the old reliable heater. There you go. That's all you gotta do. And it's uh, it's February, so that means it's Black History Month. Uh, we don't have too many rules on this podcast, uh, but in February, we uh, try to highlight uh, a story from uh, baseball history, uh, including uh, many of the great Black African American players that, uh, or people, I should say, that that have been around the game. We've done. Mamie Peanut Johnson, Gus Greenlee, Emmett Ashford, uh, lots of people. Either way, excited, Ed Z, for what you got in store with for us today. I'm actually going to, I don't want to give too much away, but I'm actually going to go off the field today. Oh, we're going off the field. We're going off the field. All right. Uh, to an integral person in the uh, breakage of the color barrier. Holy shit. Well, before we get to this off field story, uh, where can people find us, Ed Z? Uh, as I swallow my coffee, we can. Uh, <laughs> you can find us on Twitter x.com at doing baseball and on Instagram at doing dot baseball and on TikTok at doing dot baseball and I have a personal Twitter at Ed's Do Baseball and I'm at Sean Do Baseball and you can find uh, our personal favorite beer uh, at uh, Two Loons Brewing dot com. Two Loons Brewing. They're awesome. They're a delicious uh, IPA and lager uh, on LCBO shelves right now. And at your uh, local establishment, uh, I don't know if they're in every one. I imagine not, but uh, ask for them ask if you're for in there, them. and uh, maybe they'll get them in there. Yeah, that's right. And they're going to be making even more beer in the near future. So uh, yeah, once they get a little brick and mortar location going. Oh yeah, it's almost here. So uh, check them out, Two Loons Brewing. Dot com and uh, as always please enjoy responsibly and be of legal drinking age yes that's right don't 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 make your life harder than it has to be <laughs> and of course uh, before we get started here I just want to thank you for listening and uh, wherever you're listening to us uh, if you could give us a rating or review we'd greatly appreciate it and uh, once again uh, thanks for listening so are you ready to get going here Sean you I got am. the tools of ignorance on I do I do you're talking fast I am I'm speaking a little quickly <laughs> yeah all right let's slow things down and, and wind up here I'm, I'm pumped to hear this story Ed. okay well I'm gonna just say I want to Thank you for your story last uh, fortnight. Uh, you went into quite a bit of detail there, uh, going through a lot of uh, uh, different educational journals and whatnot. <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to say that mine's going to be a little bit more straightforward uh, today. I want to thank uh, Michael Marsh at Sabre for doing a lot of the the research for me here. and uh, The heavy lifting. The heavy lifting, but uh, as I usually like to shout out when, when they do that, for for me and uh we're saber members so if you uh feel inclined to become one yourself uh, sure. donating to saber.org is uh always uh, a, a great idea we think uh, especially if you're fans of baseball history such as ourselves yeah and i believe it's a saber day sometime in here around this episode too so check out saber sabr.org uh, for sure for for research to donate to become a member it's it's really great Okay, so I'll just uh, jump into it right here. June 27th, 1914, Sean, in Ooh. Detroit, Michigan, oh. John Wendell Smith was born. John Wendell Smith, okay. Yeah. John Wendell Smith, uh, known, known affectionately as Wendell Smith. Okay. He dropped the John because uh, that was also his father's name. He was born to his parents, John Henry Smith and Lena Gertrude Thompson. Uh-huh. John Sr. grew up in Dresden, Ontario, Canada. Whoa. Uh, a little fun fact that Canadian yeah, touch just, there for our Canadian fans. Just north of Kitchener, I think? I think so. It's, it is definitely in the western part of Ontario. Yep. A farming area. Farming community, for uh, sure. But uh, John was not a farmer. He was a cook for Canadian and American railroads and Great Lakes ships. Okay. In 1911, he moved on down to Detroit Rock City, 
In Detroit, Mr. Smith worked at an exclusive social organization, the city's Yondotega Club. Okay. Where he was the head steward, which was possibly where he met Henry Ford of Ford Motor Company fame. Whoa. Yeah. And I should note, Dresden's actually north of Chatham, which makes more sense because it's much closer to Detroit. Yes, yes. And and that does make sense because uh, I'll just make a quick footnote here. When I was looking through the research, uh, Michael uh, pulled a lot of his research, or some of it anyway, from the Chatham Library. Oh, yeah. That yeah. would be where Chatham it would Camp be. Library. So anyway, so he's, a, he's a, the... He, he meets Henry Ford, possibly, at, as a head steward at the Yondotega Club, and uh, he became his private chef. Okay. In 1912, he met and married Lena, who was, born in, who was a born and raised Detroiter, mm-hmm. and she was a housewife, but volunteered extensively with their church. And as mentioned, in 1914, they had their only son, John Wendell, okay. known as Wendell. Yes. So that's Wendell's mom and dad. Mm-hmm. The Smiths lived in a predominantly white working class neighborhood on Detroit's east side. And as Wendell grew up, he played Sandlot baseball with other kids on his block, where he was a pretty good pitcher. One of Wendell's friends on the Sandlots was Mike Tresh. Tresh eventually went on to spend 12 seasons in the major leagues, playing for, the Chicago, for Chicago and Cleveland. And also of note, Tresh's son, Tom, spent eight years with the Yankees, before being traded to his hometown Tigers in his final season. Well, wow. he's a he's a character in Ball Four. Oh yeah, uh, just, yeah. Just okay, a yeah, yeah. yeah. There. At that... first, I thought you were gonna say Mike Trout at first. No, no. <laughs> he played with Mike Trout back in the Sandlot days. <laughs> yeah. Mike Trout's just an immortal. <laughs> yeah, that's right. He's a <laughs> wizard. <laughs> Uh, in his days as a youth, Wendell and his good friend and neighbor Martin Hogan would walk to Mack Park in their neighborhood, even without money, and likely with some childish charm would convince the gatekeepers to let them in after a few innings to see the Detroit Stars and Turkey Stearns. Oh, damn. That's a man. Turkey uh, Stearns is I a man. I know. I've been to that field where the Detroit Stars played. I know. I, I just... Thought I'd throw that in there. Yeah, yeah you, you should probably that. caveat yeah. that Turkey Stearns is a man. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> you can't just yeah. be like, so we had Turkey Stearns. I know you would know, but uh, <laughs> just to clarify for those that don't, Turkey Stearns is a man. Yes. Uh, so Wendell attended Southeastern High School and played basketball for the Detroit Athletic Association team at the Central Community Center. Okay. So he's a basketball guy, too. Mm-hmm. Uh, despite good play and strong accolades for the community center squad, Smith experienced some racial problems at school. Quote, I know it was hard for him, Hogan said in a phone interview with Michael Marsh for his Sabre article. He was not permitted to play sports. I don't know whose policy it was. I feel like it was most people's policy. Most people's at that time. policy yes. at yeah. the time. Yeah. For, so yeah. he's, he's, a, he's Wendell's black. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I wasn't a hundred percent sure on that, but I assumed so. Yeah, yeah. but you I said he he was growing that. up like in Dresden, Ontario. He, like no, he, no, he d- his father grew up in Dresden oh, and sorry. then moved to Detroit. Oh, yes. And then met his wife, and then uh, they had Wendell. Okay. And they but they grew up in a in a white neighborhood. Yeah, that in Detroit. was the curveball for me right there. That was the curveball that I mm-hmm. was trying to. I was like, oh wait, is this? Because you mentioned it was off the field a little bit, so yes. I wasn't sure a hundred percent whether this person was. Yeah, either way. So we'll get to it being off off the field. But okay. yes, Wendell, just to clarify, the Smiths are a black family. Yeah, a, that's fine. In in a, a, and, in a and he's facing class. segregation problems trying to play sports. Yeah, he can't play for the school teams. God so damn. he can only play in the community center. Yeah, I assume with like a mostly black team. <laughs> it's like, all right, we got, we got, we'll desegregate the schools. Everyone can learn together, but I'll be damned if they fucking grab a basketball together. <laughs> yes, yes, and and this is like, I guess this is probably the thirties. Yeah, yeah, if he was sure born in nineteen ten, late twenties, nineteen fourteen. Yeah, yes, yeah, okay, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so. So outside of school, Smith also played bas- baseball yep. for the American Legion, but officials removed him from the team. Because he he's black. black. Yes. God damn it. He would be reinstated, though, after daddy's old friend and boss, Henry Ford, vouched for him. Why does... This, once again, if you know the history of Henry Ford, 
interesting. I was gonna say I was I was surprised to read this because like I know I know Henry Ford is like known to be you know racist and a- anti semitic. But, yeah, but uh, I guess he, you know I assumed he would be well. But you know if you are able to if Henry Ford is able to exert any kind of opinion in Detroit, it definitely holds water. So if he yes. wants your son to play fucking baseball. Your yeah. son's playing baseball. Exactly. So, so as you say, his word carries a lot of water, and he, he gets back on the team. So Wendell's out there pitching for the American Legion as a teenager, and he's doing quite well. So well, in fact, that he was tasked to pitch in the American Legion championship game, which was on the radar of the Detroit Tigers scouts, particularly Wish Egan, who was in attendance. Okay. But something would happen at this game that would inspire Wendell to a life of activism the rest of his days. That's wild. And also, this man's name is Wish. Yeah, Wish Egan, yeah. Like W-I-S-H. That's right, yeah. There you go. Yeah, exactly how... I don't know how else you'd spell Wish, but... I don't know either, but I can't think of a short form or a long form for Wish. It's got to be a nickname. It's got to be. Anyway, Smith... Smith, Wendell Smith, told Jerome Holtzman for his book, No Cheering in the Press Box, that he won the American Legion championship game, but Detroit signed the losing pitcher. Son of a bitch. Egan telling Wendell he couldn't sign him because he was black. And then to add salt to the wound, he watched as his friend and teammate Mike Tresh signed as well. Smith cried. I would cry too. Like, you (laughs) were... Like, it's just unfair. Yeah. Yeah. You win the game... And, and you like you watch the 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 failing pitcher for lack of a better term. Anyway, moving on. Smith, and dude, Le- I'm sorry to interrupt you. Go ahead. I thought Wish Egan's name was gonna be. But I. What is it? Aloysius Jerome. Egan. That makes perfect sense why his name's Wish. What a name. Aloysius Jerome Egan. He's delicious Aloysius. You Holy motherfucker. fucking Christ. Anyways, <laughs> continue. Okay, so Smith enrolled in West Virginia State College, which is now the West Virginia State University, after high school in 1933 and majored in phys ed. Smith was able to compete for the school's basketball and baseball teams, frankly, likely this time due to the fact that the school located in Institute West Virginia was predominantly black. Mm -hmm. While Smith attended West Virginia State, he roomed with Will Robinson, with whom he maintained a strong friendship throughout their lives. Robinson later became the first black scout in NFL, in the NFL, and the first black head coach for an NCAA Division I school when he coached the Illinois State University basketball team. It was just a nice, you know, aside about about his roommate who yeah. set a bunch of milestones himself. Mm-hmm. Uh, Wendell also met Sarah Wright at the school. She minored in music, and by the late 1930s, after courtship, they were married. Oh, cool! So he's got his he's got his lady there. He's got a wife. There you go. Uh, in college, Smith was the football team's publicist. He wrote a sports column for the campus newspaper, The Yellow Jacket. Let me tell you about this football team. <laughs> yeah, They're tell. great. They're amazing. Let me tell you, you should write about them yourselves. There's 3,000 words about how awesome the football team they is. They are fantastic. I'm just a columnist, also <laughs> a publicist. <laughs> <laughs> In one column, he praised Pittsburgh Courier columnist Chess Washington for his coverage of the school's football team. He does great at telling our football team how great they are because they're great. That's right. <laughs> so he's doing a bit of butt kissing yes. there, right? <laughs> and it pays off because in 1937, after Smith graduated, he got a job with the Courier. Cool. One of the leading black newspapers in the United States. Yeah. So Smith started with a salary of $17 per week. Congrats. I, yeah. That seems very little. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I didn't do the inflation conversion, but it doesn't seem We're in the 1930s, like right? Yeah. A job's a job. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, that's fair enough. Uh, he extensively covered Negro League baseball, and in 1938, Smith launched his fight against baseball's color barrier with the column A Strange Tribe, which criticized blacks for supporting Major League Baseball when it maintained a color line. From the May 14th Pittsburgh Courier column, Smitty's Sports Spurts. Smitty's Spurts Sports Spurts. 
He's spurting the sports. Yes, in his he's sports spurts. spurts about sports in his column. I did the math. It, 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 I just did 1935. It's about $380. A week? Yeah. I mean, I feel like that would go further back then, but that's but still not very, very much. little. Yeah. 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 So from from Smitty's sports spurts on May 14th. I can't in the take Pittsburgh that seriously. Curve, I can't fucking do it. Quote, they're real troopers, these guys who risk their money and devote their lives to Negro baseball. We black folk offer no encouragement and don't seem to care if they make a go of it or not. We literally ignore them completely. With our noses high and our hands deep in our pockets, squeezing the same dollar that we hand out to white players, we walk past their ballparks and go to the major league game. Nuts. That's what we are. Just plain nuts. Yeah, it's, it's a nice reflection on, uh, you know, just saying like, yeah, why I'm are saying we if not? They're, yeah, if they're, if they're excluding us, why are we... Why are we so happy to give them their money when we have a perfectly good alternative? That yes, yes. would, like, help the people that are fucking crazy enough to want to be... Mm-hmm. Professionals in the Negro leagues, even though they know they have no fucking hope, and like you know, you know, I mean, yes, yeah. Anyways, continue, yes, like at it, the it's, yeah. Well, but that's the thing is, like, it's just like, come on, people, like there is an here, alternative here, here, yeah, here. Here's a cause to get behind, yeah. you know. Like, anyway, uh, the following year, Smith surveyed major league players about their attitudes towards black players. They're like black players. <laughs> I, I don't, I don't <laughs> see any. <Yeah. laughs> We don't have any of those around here, sir. Good day. (laughs) That's not what happened. His intentions of this survey were to disprove the idea that players were opposed uh, to blacks in the major leagues. He surveyed 40 players and eight managers at the Shenley Hotel near Forbes Field, and as Smith predicted, most of the interviewees said they did not oppose integration. Oh, cool. The courier management liked the survey and gave Wendell a raise. (laughs) <laughs> you, sir, are going to make $390 yeah, a week yeah. now. <laughs> 1750 <laughs> In 1940, Sarah gave birth to their son, John Wendell Smith Jr. Uh-huh. The boy would be Smith's only child. That same year, the paper promoted him to city editor, and he eventually advanced to sports editor. Okay, I don't know why. I think that's like, you know, national sports editor. Oh, yeah. As so opposed he's, he's, to just being the city news guy. Yeah, so he's he's moving up the, the, the ranks at this newspaper pretty darn quick. Yes. Yeah. So uh, Got a family going, you know. Just, uh, yeah, sounds yeah. like he's, he's, he's growing quite a life for himself. Mm-hmm. Uh, Smith, along with other black sports writers like Joe Bostick of the Harlem-based People's Voice, and Sam Lacey of the Washington, D.C.-based Afro-American campaigned for the integration of Major League Baseball during the 1940s. Lacey spoke of their mutual passion for the fight when he wrote for the Afro-American in March of 1973, quote, We talked deep into the nights in ghetto hotels, at his house in Pittsburgh, and in my home in Washington, at dimly lit ballparks where our paths would cross while covering Negro National League games, in lunchrooms in Harlem, and in greasy spoon hog mod joints in Memphis, St. Louis, Baltimore, and Philadelphia. I guess, you know, reflecting years later. Or, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, what their relationship was like at the time. That's pretty cool. Yeah. So the activist writers drum up a scheme to just take some Negro League players to training camp themselves. Damn. Yeah. So they're getting really schemey yeah uh, getting kind of audacious with like their you yeah. know they're just gonna take some players that they think are good enough <laughs> and be like Here we go. met at that hotel you said you were good with this here you go <laughs> <laughs> no 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 like well the, the, they would meet at the hotels and then just you know their idea was okay you take a few guys down to boston and i'll take a few guys to dodgers camp and no, we'll but just it, force their hand i meant like because he did that survey with all the guys oh, at the right, hotel right yeah yeah so yeah. he was just I like see what you're you saying. said you were cool with black players <laughs> playing in the major leagues here we here's go. a couple yeah, you know, <laughs> have yeah. fun coach <laughs> yeah yeah so so bostock took two players to the brooklyn dodgers camp unannounced and demanded a tryout in early April 1945. Whoa, I did not know this. I didn't know this either. In late April, Smith pre-arranged a tryout for three players at the camp 
of the Boston Red Sox. <laughs> Which, if we want to go back early days, yeah, yeah. was a little bit of a futile effort. Yes, well, I mentioned it after the next paragraph. Yeah. But yes, we, we know from, uh, the, I think it's the Tom, Tom Yawkey Yawkey episode, episode where, yeah. you know, the the... The Red Sox were the last team to integrate, so yep. you know there there wasn't very much hope no. for the Red Sox tryout. But anyway, the three players to go to Boston were Kansas City Monarch shortstop Jackie Robinson. I've heard of him. Marvin Williams, second baseman for the Philadelphia Stars, mm -hmm. and Sam Jethro of the Cleveland Buckeyes, who played center field. And the tryout had little to no publicity in the mainstream. Yep, and you know. Probably because, as we just mentioned, there was really no chance. There was no serious. With Boston. Yeah, you know. So Smitty's scheme doesn't do much to break the Red Sox, but Lacey might have gained a footing in Brooklyn, which turned out to be fortuitous for Wendell, since he would run into Branch Rickey in New York while he was traveling home to Pittsburgh. Okay. Ricky asked Smith if he thought any of the players from the Boston tryout could have success in the majors. And Smith famously recommended Robinson. Okay. Smith later told sports writer Shirley Povich, Maury's dad. Like Maury's dad? <laughs> yeah, the Maury. You're the father. <laughs> you are the father of Branch Ricky's integration screen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Maury's father, Shirley, yeah. who wrote about it in All Those Mornings, why he had touted Robinson, Smith said, quote, He wasn't the best Negro player I could have named. There were others with more ability, but to have recommended them would have been a disservice to the cause of the Negroes. I recommended Robinson because he wouldn't make Negro baseball look bad either on the field or off of it. Jackie got my vote because of many factors. He was a college boy. I knew he would understand the great responsibilities of being the first Negro invited to play in organized baseball in more than 60 years. He was a mannerly fellow. At UCLA, he had played before big crowds. I gambled that he wouldn't freeze up under pressure, and he had an honorable discharge from the Army as a lieutenant. Which are all good things, but, you know, I think you know, looking back now, it's just, it's, it's a sad commentary that like they had to yeah. have such a model citizen yeah. because, you know, they couldn't just like look past the fact that he was black and just look at yeah, his baseball ability. He had to be perfect in every way. Yes. He had to, well, and that's, I'm also like, like, yeah, look, don't downplay this episode. Like, I think a lot of the, the social general baseball knowledge is is that branch ricky was the one that that was searching for all these traits in in the man and the fact that that you're telling me that, that, that this guy was the one this that, was a wendell's like this is criteria him. for a guy yeah and being like well, yeah here branch take this guy but you know I don't know how I have the idea, but obviously I'm a fucking white Canadian dude. But in my idea, I thought Branch Rickey was the one looking for those kind of qualities. It wasn't. It wasn't a suggestion from a black sports writer. It was Branch Rickey's. I. I am wrong because. Right. Well, uh, I mean, I think. I think like it's, it's I've a, seen 42. You've exactly. seen 42, it's, it's, and that's sort of how it's portrayed. Yeah. That you know that Harrison Ford's Branch Ricky needs. Yeah. Someone, Someone to fit that criteria so that, you know, yeah. he can have a good player on his team. But, yeah. you know, I think the reality is that it was Wendell Smith who was like, if we want to break the color barrier, this is the type of player we need to have, unfortunately, for better or worse. But well, this is the type of player we need to have to not rock the boat for white America. Yeah. So that's just changes a lot for me. So. Cool. Yes. So I will continue. Smith had gained wide admiration for his venture, but did not escape criticism. Chicago defender columnist Faye Young claimed Smith was, quote, anxious to grab off some glory when he took players to the tryout with the Red Sox. I should mention Faye Young's also, uh, the, the, the Chicago defender is also another black newspaper. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, so he's another, he's another, he, he, but he's, he's trying to get a little bit of, publicity from it he, well he that's what he's claiming anyway yeah. but uh by the time we get to the end i think there's some other writers that that you know posthumously give him some quotes that are 
you know, contrary to that yeah. notion. But here's another criticism. A.S. Doc Young wrote in his 1969 article for Ebony, the black athlete in the golden age of sports, stereotypes, prejudices, and other unfunny hilarities, which is a really long title. <laughs> yep. Quote, when a black Brooklyn player opted to stay in a black hotel instead of housing with the rest of the team in a white-owned hotel, Smith wrote an angry letter to the player. The player gave the letter to a team official who tried to chastise Smith. Interesting. So he's like, you know, saying... You know, they, they, they've they they've finally let us integrate, and now you're not, like, taking advantage. advantage of the opportunity. Which, like, I mean, I get the point that he's coming from, but I also, you know, I'm, I'm sure even though it's available to you, going and staying with the white players who are possibly not, like, too Welcoming. receptive of the idea, <laughs> yeah. you know, wouldn't be... Very inviting to you, you know? yeah. And he, so he's he's really pushing, like he's really pushing them to like not just not just play, but really integrate the. And, and I under I can understand it a little bit from both sides that like obviously the players like, hey, I'm not welcome there. So like, why the fuck would I do that? Mm-hmm. And like, but on his end, he's just like, no, sorry, you're the like you're the you're the person that has to do this for the rest of us. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and it kind of like it sucks. But I kind of get where both sides are coming from there. But, like, I definitely understand that. Like, the player's like, hey, I'm not welcome there. I'm going to go stay at the Black Hotel. Yeah. That's fine with me. And yeah. Yeah. Like, can you blame him? Not really. <laughs> no. No. Uh, so, continuing on. Regardless of this criticism, that August of 1945, Ricky arranged to meet with Robinson in Brooklyn and signed him to a minor league contract two months later. Mm-hmm. Ricky paid Smith to serve as Robinson's mentor and to assist with arranging lodging and travel during the 1946 and 1947 seasons. So he's like Robinson's de facto agent, kind of. Pretty much, yeah. 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 Like, I mean, that wasn't his original intention, but Ricky's like, yeah, you said this is the guy, yeah. and uh, I'm certainly not calling hotels and shit for him, so. <laughs> I'm Bridge <So>, Ricky. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't yeah. give a shit. Make sure he survives. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I pay him. That's as far as my responsibility. I will goes. take yeah. the credit and talk big stuff about myself, but uh, <laughs> you make sure that he like has to eat and, and, and sleep somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So they headed north to Montreal Yes. for the 1946 season as Jackie played for the Dodgers AAA affiliate, the Montreal Royals. Mm-hmm. Robinson led the Royals to the International League title and mm-hmm. victory in the Little World Series. Smith obviously also wrote extensive coverage of his progress. The following year, on April 15th, 1947, the campaign started by Smith, Bostick, and Lacey saw its greatest milestone. Smith sat along with other sports writers in the press box at the Brooklyn Dodgers' Ebbets Field as the Dodgers played their season opener against the Boston Braves. Smith took notes while Jackie Robinson took the field as the first black man to play a Major League Baseball in the modern era. The Dodgers won the game 5-3. to three. Robinson didn't record a hit, but he scored one run and played an errorless game at first base. Smith wrote, quote, It was a great day. It was a great day for Brooklyn. It was a great day for baseball. And above all, it was a great day for Jackie Robinson. It's in capitals, so. Yeah, you didn't say <laughs> so that. Yelled yeah. yeah. Later that year, in August 1947, Smith joined the afternoon paper, the Chicago Herald American, making him one of the first black sports writers to work for a daily newspaper. Oh, shit. So he's, he's moved on from the black press into the mainstream. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Smith initially split time between the Courier in Pittsburgh and the Herald American before he eventually left the Pittsburgh paper, although he continued to freelance for the Courier until 67. Okay. He contended in one of his first articles for the Herald American that Robinson's signing proved anyone could succeed in the United States. Quote, It's a story of this great country and proves beyond every doubt that a man can soar to lofty heights in the United States if he has the ability, he wrote. True enough, the struggle may be more difficult for some more than others, but Jackie Robinson, a Negro and first baseman for the Brooklyn Dodgers, is proof enough that it can happen. 
I mean, sure. <laughs> yeah. Think of all the factors and all the people that it did not happen for before that. For but... sure. And I think that's where he adds the caveat. You know, the struggle may be more difficult for some than others. But... Well, it was impossible for a lot of people, though. Yes. Like, that's... I mean, I, I think I disagree with his... I think I think he's celebrating the moment they were at. And I think that's that's a positive thing. But, like... It's a little bit of like, well, look where we are now, and not like, wow, it was like, as I say, like it was, it was legitimately impossible for for like years and years and years. And Jackie Robinson made it possible, and you should celebrate that. But like, you can't be like, well, anything is possible. But like, <laughs> you know, because that discounts that it true, was not true. possible for a lot of people. True. I think uh, yes. I think hey. he just like putting a positive. Spin Fuck you, Wendell. Like, no I'm kidding. <laughs> 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 Moving on. In 1948, he wrote the first biography of a Robinson, Jackie Robinson, My Own Story. And that same year, Smith became one of the first black writers admitted into the Baseball Writers Association of America. Sweet. All this success in the newsroom and time away from home strained the marriage between Wendell and Sarah. They divorced. Sarah obtained a Broadcast Music Incorporated composer's license after their divorce. What? Remember, she was a music major. Yeah, right? yeah, she was. Right? She handled about 30 recording acts, including their only son, John Wendell Smith Jr. Who is who? Who followed his mother into the music business, and she helped manage his career. He released a few songs, including the high-tempo rocker called Pudding Pie and the B-side, Tonight's My Night to Cry, both in 1959, as well as a bluesy ode to Nashville, Tennessee. Cool. Do you want to hear Puddin' Pie right now? Try not to get sued by United Artists, but... Yeah, why not? I think if we do 20 seconds or less... (laughs) (laughs) I mean, it's pretty good. I like the drums. (laughs) It's amazing. That was amazing. Yeah. So, so, so he, so this kid is this yeah, musician. So, yeah, yeah. So their kid went on to a pretty, you know, fairly successful uh, music career. I mean, he's got a he's got a single so, out with United Artists. So, there you go, you Pudding know. Pie, baby. Yeah. So that's a fun little family aside there. Yeah, uh, I thought you were going somewhere big. I was like, and he is <laughs> Michael Jackson. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. no, no, it's not that big of a twist. Uh, so Sarah remarried, and Wendell did too. He married Wyanella Hicks in 1949. They met while they worked at the Courier together. Mm-hmm. After they moved to Chicago, Wyanella worked as a secretary for the owner of the Harlem Globetrotters. It's kind cool. of another little interesting thing. Uh, in 1949, Smith's previously sweet rapport with Robinson soured a little. Smith alleged Robinson, quote, isn't as popular in the press box as he once was after Robinson hinted that some sports reporters were treating him unfairly after a confrontation between him and a teammate. So I guess Robinson, a bunch of reporters must have wrote some bad stuff about Robinson uh, fighting with a teammate. Sure. He took it personally. Yeah. So uh, anyway. Uh, according to a Chicago Tribune article written by uh, Holtzman, who I mentioned before, in 1993, Smith had told him he and Robinson had fallen out at one point and hadn't spoken for nearly 10 years. Nope. However, in the same article, Holtzman reported that Smith's wife, Wyanella, recalled that the two had remained friends. So what I'm kind of thinking is like they had like a fight sort of over that like reporting in the article but Mm -hmm. it wasn't enough to like make them hate each other they just like sort of as friends do you know yeah they butted heads butt heads and then sort of drift apart for a a while you know Uh, but they you know she's still nice to hear from them (laughs) yes yes. uh smith also became a noted boxing writer in addition to his baseball writing, he was elected president of the Chicago Boxing Writers and Broadcasters Association in 1953. In March of 1958, he provided radio commentary along with Dr. Joyce Brothers and Jack Drees for the middleweight championship fight between Sugar Ray Robinson and Carmen Basillo at the Chicago Stadium, another first for a black sports journalist. 
Cool. He was the first guy to do a radio broadcast for a boxing match. Oh, that's awesome. And then in 1961, Smith would conduct his final media crusade. At the time, teams who still held their spring training camps in the southern states held segregated accommodations, and black players had lodgings separate from their white counterparts. As you might expect, the lodgings and dining available to them were less desirable, and Smith covered the issue in both the Chicago's American, which had evolved from the Herald American and the Courier. In the January 23rd, 1961 issue of the American, Smith wrote, quote, Beneath the apparently tranquil surface of baseball, there is a growing feeling of resentment among Negro major leaguers who still experience embarrassment, humiliation, and even indignities during spring training in the South. This stature of respectability the Negro has attained since Robinson's spectacular appearance on the major league scene has given him a new sense of dignity and pride, and he wants the same treatment in the South during spring training that he has earned in the North. Because, yeah, (laughs) this makes absolute sense. Quote, the Negro player resents the fact that he is not permitted to stay in the same hotels with his teammates during spring training and is protesting the fact that they cannot eat in the same restaurants nor enjoy other privileges. So after Smith wrote this article, Mm -hmm. the vice president of the Milwaukee Braves, Bertie Tebbets, hell of a name. Yep. Argued against Smith saying that the black players on the Braves were satisfied with their segregated accommodations. Look, they're perfectly happy. Just ask them, and if they say any differently, they won't play for us. (laughs) I mean, they won't say anything differently. (laughs) Yes. And this pisses Wendell off, obviously. Yeah. So he writes an angry reply in his sports beat on February 18th. Quote, when Mr. Bertie Tebbets was a major league catcher, he was acknowledged as a competent receiver, but never considered dangerous at the plate in a crucial situation. On the basis of his reception to the nationwide protests over the deplorable conditions which Negro players, particularly his own, must tolerate in the South during spring training season, one can only conclude that Mr. Tebbets is still a weakling when the chips are down. Damn. Fucking, that's that's some typewriter fire. Yeah. And, you know, full integration through out spring training accommodations in Florida and Arizona would take place over the next two years. Yeah. So, so hey, remember when you were shit at hitting? <laughs> yeah. yeah so you just you talk shit suck. about his hitting. <laughs> just like, all right, fuck. I don't want anyone to know about that, so we better upgrade the black players' <laughs> oh, accommodations. Like, well, and you're talking about Hank Aaron here, right? Like, eventually. That's like, true. Yeah, like... Yeah, that is true. Smith earned recognition for the desegregation campaign. The magazine editor and publisher called him a reporter with a built-in social conscience. (laughs) He's black, so he cares about black people. That means he has a social conscience. Built in. (laughs) Built in. Like, what the fuck? I mean, it's once again, it's it's a nice thing to say, but if you really look at it contextually, you're like, um... (laughs) What does that mean? Yeah. Like, <laughs> Sorry. Why? No, no, I get, I get you. Like, well, you know, contextually, you're right. Like, it's, it's, it shouldn't be an accolade worth mentioning. Like, it should just be, you know. He cares about things. Yeah. It just should be normal. Yeah. Uh, two years later, in February of 1963, Smith left the American and joined WBBM to cover news and sports. He became one of the first black journalists to work for a Chicago television station. A year later, he switched to WGN. Great station. Great station. (laughs) Smith eventually became the sports anchor for the station's 10 p.m. news broadcast. In 1969, he began a weekly sports column for the Chicago Sun-Times. In 1971, he was named to the special committee on the Negro League for the Baseball Hall of Fame. In January 1972, he won election as the first black president of the Chicago Press Club. By 1972, Smith and Robinson had once again become close, and Jackie acknowledged acknowledged his debt to Smith for his recommendation to Ricky in his final autobiography, I Never Had It Made, an autobiography of Jackie Robinson. After Robinson passed away that October... Smith memorialized him in a column for the Sun-Times, and shortly afterward, on November 26, 1972, Smith passed away as well. 
Damn, so they died pretty close. Yeah, like within months of each other. Wow. We're within a month or so. Uh, tributes flowed in from Chicago and national journalists. Quote, there was a soft humor about Wendell. Never anything vicious, Jack Griffin wrote for the Sun-Times. Quote, he was an able newsman, but more a respected gentleman in this profession and a dear friend, Irv Cup Sinnett wrote for the Sun Times as well. Jack Griffin said, quote, I knew the part he had played in bringing Jackie Robinson in the major leagues as baseball's first back black player. I knew because other people told me. Wendell never mentioned it. He never operated with the Bugles playing, which that's the quote that I was talking about earlier, where yes. how the other guy, you know, said he was trying to get some recognition, but this guy's saying he he operated with modesty the whole way. Well, yeah, so that's interesting. Yeah, so there might have, I mean, yeah, there might have been some jealousy in that earlier quote, mm -hmm. possibly. But also, I mean, it's nice to hear that he's, he just kind of, like, went about his business and never really tooted his own horn about it later on in life, at very least. He might have done it at the time, though. You never know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, maybe, like, was, was playing the long game, yeah. you know. But anyway, uh, here's, I think this is a final quote from another uh, writer. The Chicago Tribune, Robert Cromie, wrote... Uh, quote, he was a beautiful guy who liked all good people and was fun. In turn, liked by everyone, worth bothering about. He could lose his temper. I once saw him shove a burly guard inside Yan aside in the Yankee Stadium after an altercation with an ease that made me suddenly realize how very strong he was. <laughs> but laughter was more his style. I always think of him as laughing because he had such a delightful sense of humor. Like old soldiers... Sorry, that's the end of that writer's quote. Yeah. And then it's the last one here. Quote, like old soldiers, sports writers never die. They just fade away. And black baseball players of the Negro Leagues, as well as black major leaguers of the present and the past, should never let his memory die. Brad Pye Jr. wrote for the LA Sentinel. Sentinel. And the memory of Wendell Smith has not died. Since his death, death, there have been scholarships and countless awards given in his name. Chicago named a school after him in 1973 and a park after him in 1975. In oh. 1982, Smith was elected to the Chicago Journalism Hall of Fame, to the Chicago Land Sports Hall of Fame in 1983, and to the West Virginia University Hall of Fame in 1993. That same year, the Baseball Writers Association of America's Spink Award Committee nominated Smith and the full membership voted for it making him the first African-American to receive the honor. Wyanella Smith, his wife, worked in the public information office for the cities of Chicago's Department of Aging. She eventually moved into a senior residence facility located on the city's south side. The same facility housed Mary Frances Veck, Ooh. the widow of former White Sox owner Bill Veck. Yeah. And the two women maintained a strong friendship until Wyanella passed away in 2020. No shit. Which is just another funny family yeah. aside That's of so Wendell funny. Smith. Wendell Smith never forgot how he felt when he was left on the American Legion field that day as a teenager and vowed a life of activism the rest of his days so that one day no black kid would have to feel the same way. And to a certain extent, he was able to achieve that. He was one of the most accomplished writers of his day, but he remained humble and never forgot his roots or that the road was paved along the way by those that came before him. So I'll close this episode with a quote of Wendell's from his Wendell Smith sports beat column from September 17th, 1961, when he wrote, quote, this has been a life of splendor and excitement, baseball training camps, fight camps, the Olympics, and other arenas of excitement for the younger ones that the older ones by their dedication and perseverance made possible. Thus, those who sit in the press box at the World Series or ringside at the big fights or in typewriter row at similar classics should remember that they are there because of the ceaseless campaigns waged by those before them, particularly by those representing the newspaper. Damn. Solid. So that's it. That's the story of Wendell Smith and how he uh, campaigned to, you know, integrate baseball in the first place in the modern era and yeah. then also uh to to you know get some better treatment for players in uh spring training once they were actually were integrated and right. yeah i guess i didn't really intend to uh shed light on the fact that you know it was probably in fact wendell who 
had the criteria first for you know a player that would be perfect to break the color barrier but uh yeah. damn anyway now yeah, you called that a fastball that was uh that was a bit of a that was a little bit of a change up there for me because i i was not expecting i fuck man like for a while you like the beginning detroit i was like are we going to talk turkey stearns are we going to talk about no but it just absolutely, I I love the ending too. Just just like tying it together with like baseball and clearly made a big impression in Chicago. But like, goddamn, yeah, I had no idea his uh, importance to mm -hmm. well, I, I that think, history. I think we've all, I mean, anyone anyone who has seen the the movie Forty Two, yeah, kind of sees like a somewhat like. Uh, I mean, I don't know. I would call it like romanticized version of of, course, yeah. of his life, but it a like simplistic. kind of a simplistic version. And and yeah, I think it's I think it uh, leaves out the fact of like there were people pushing for this. Yes. Yeah. And yeah. as you say in the end quote, like there were people like there were like newspapers were the you know voice at the time, like it's sim mm -hmm. similar to whatever whatever we want to talk about now, like look like media wise, but. Mm -hmm. That was the most important. So yeah, like this is. Uh, yeah, well, I didn't I expect I, that to be about a sports writer when you started, especially starting talking about that, talking about Aloysius Fuckhead or whatever the fuck his Aloysius name was. Egan? Like, yeah, I was like, is this guy gonna like you know almost make it to the major leagues eventually? And then it was like, bam, sports writer yeah, and no. influence on Robinson, and not only that, he wrote the book on Robinson, right? Mm -hmm. A couple of them, I a think. couple. Yeah. So yeah. damn. So cool. anyway, that's the story of Wendell Smith. Well, that was amazing. Thanks so much. And fucking write. Give us a review. Give us a rating. That was a great <laughs> story. It was great. Uh, <laughs> thanks so much, Edsy. Where can people find us on the on the internet? Uh, you can find us on Twitter at Doing Baseball and on Instagram at Doing Dot Baseball and on TikTok at Doing Dot Baseball. And I'm on Twitter at Eds Do Baseball. I'm at Sean Do Baseball. And uh, yeah, we appreciate you tuning in. Check out Two Loons Brewing at TwoLoonsBrewing.com. Tune in in two weeks. Uh, we'll have another baseball history episode for you. And until then, I'm Sean. And I'm Ed. And we were bringing you the baseball history. Okay, bye. Bye. Bye.